Okay, we are live. Hope you, hopefully you can hear us. There's no weird echoes. It would be nice if I could start one of these shows and there's like no problems. So, <laughs> so far, so good. Let me know in the chat if there's an issue and I'll, I'll try to take care of it. So uh, we're here with Sean Kotebert and we're going to talk about the plant that's on the screen right here. And that is valerian. And it's a very interesting plant and the human, human race is known about its uh, powers for quite a long time. And uh, this man has been looking into it and uh, has, has a chemi chemical understanding of the world and is going to talk to us about the, uh, this plant. So I have my experience with it, but uh, I, I want to hear about like what's, like what's happening, you know, and that's what he's here to explain to us. So I'm going to leave this picture up here for the first little bit while uh, he introduces and then he's got a presentation that he's going to... Uh, uh, share with us and I'm going to share my thoughts and my experiences with this stuff because that's my plant. I took that picture this morning and uh, I've been, uh, that plant's been with us for, I guess, about five or six years now. And if, if I have to go anywhere, it's going with me. So <laughs> anyway, uh, this is Sean. Uh, to those of you that uh, saw the chemistry episode in, uh, before, uh, it's the, you, you already know this man. So yeah, keep your ears open. Welcome, man. <laughs> thanks, thanks for having me again. Uh, yeah, it's a beautiful plant. Um, you know, like you were saying in the in the pre-show a little bit, it's, the roots aren't very spectacular. They just looks like other roots, you know. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah I, I was looking into this plant, and uh, I didn't know where I was going. I literally watched the Foolish Gardener episode, and uh, I think that was the title. And I was like, oh, Valerian, he's got that on his property. I wonder what that's all about. And when I started looking into it, it was really mind expanding to, to see how it's been used for so long by the Greeks, the Romans, it's in Chinese traditional medicine, uh, Native Americans use it. Um, and it led me down a path that really stimulated my curiosity um, about natural products in general and specifically this plant. Um, and yeah, I did do a little presentation I think it got uploaded and then I got to share it or do you share it? I, I think that I'll share it. Let me get rid of my, my picture here. And then, so we're not overloading things. Oh and there's, yeah, there's that. And then let me just remove. Everybody knows to bear with me. So let's add this one. So yeah, um, today we're gonna dive into valerian root. Um, here is a less uh, aesthetically pleasing picture of it than Elka's. Uh, and, you know, just in general, it's got a flowering uh, top. It's got some serrated leaves. And, and this is where I would uh, like to ask Elka, like what is he, wh what would he look for as far as identifying this maybe in nature? Is it, is the leaves unique to it? You know, they're not alternating or anything like that um uh yeah the 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 weird thing about it is it, it looks a lot like a queen anne's lace or a carrot or something but the difference is is it's not symmetrical like this picture is kind of misleading like that okay. that doesn't look like a valeria it, it obviously is but all of the valerian that i've seen whether mine or like uh, other people or or at a uh, like a botanical garden it's uh what i'm getting at is it's not uh symmetrical like all of the leaves are on one side of the stem oh, and it hangs to that one side yeah it's a very unique uh, characteristic of the, this plant and everyone that i've seen is like that except for this picture that you brought up sean so well this is probably like a, a 2d print you know so they probably laid this flat on, onto a two-dimensional surface and that's why it looks so okay you know, that I don't know if that sense. makes sense, but um, it, it yeah, does very, because they're supposed to be like that. It's like with I, I don't know if all of them are that way. Just all the thing, all the ones that I've seen. Right. Very interesting. Excellent. Um, so valerian root um, in the brain, it seems to target more of the limbic system. And this cluster right here is your amygdala. Underneath that is your is your hippocampus. You have your thalamus here. And then your hypothalamus is right under it. And what the amygdala does is it attempts to regulate the stress response. Um, 
it's your, your fight or flight response. So if you see a snake in the woods, you know, it activates the amygdala and excites it such that you can get to a place of safety before you get bitten by a, a poisonous snake or a rock falls on you or whatever from an evolutionary context. Now, what's interesting about valerian root is it's known for its insomnia-like properties and or its hypnotic-like properties and to treat insomnia. So valerian root is acting essentially in the opposite way of the fight or flight response. It's actually trying to inhibit and calm that center of the brain down such that you can, you know, relax essentially and not be constantly on guard with an overactive amygdala. Um, this, you know, limbic system is essentially a mammalian brain. And then the cortex and all the fancy stuff on the outside is, is what it starts to differentiate, you know, humans from, from uh, lower level mammals, let's say. Um, so we're going to talk a little more about some of the specific receptors in mainly the amygdala. Um, and they're all over the place. It's not just concentrated to this one almond-like structure in the brain. Um, but to understand how these compounds are, are helping to relax us and, and get a good night's sleep, um, we need to understand our GABA system. So GABA is short for the gamma amino butyric acid acid uh, receptor and this is a cartoon of it and what i mean by that it's it's literally just a drawing it's 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 not animated or anything like that but if you look at it you've got you've got some alpha receptors here or subunits rather so you've got two alpha subunits and these come in different flavors um you know the normal convention is you have an alpha one or an alpha two or an alpha three uh subunit within your gamma receptors and that can lead to a little bit of individual difference on how these systems um, are activated or deactivated. Um, you also have a beta subunit. And these two beta subunits, again, come in those various flavors of beta 1, 2, and 3. And in the literature, they cite that it's the beta 3 subunit that is, um, which is where some of these valerian root compounds are, are triggering. So what they did to do this was they replaced the uh, asparagine, I think it was 234, I'm sorry, 265. They replaced the asparagine in this protein structure with a serine at the 265th you know, place. So maybe I should back up a second. Um, so proteins, they have a, a linear form and we call that the primary structure. So if you count it out from, from 1 to 265, that's the asparagine that you're looking at when you're doing like a knockout study and replacing it with a serine amino acid to see if the biological activity is different or the same. Um, and then the protein will fold up into a secondary, tertiary, and then eventually a, a quaternary structure, which is what this cartoon is looking at, is the culmination of all the proteins folded together and then also interacting with it within the subunits um, themselves. And when you're talking about these types of proteins they are typically globular. So they're gonna form like globulars, you know, uh, instead of uh, like collagen is a triple uh, right-handed helix, I believe. And we use that for structural supports and stuff like that. Um, you know, muscle tissue is also protein, but it's, you know, long sheets, uh, probably beta sheets. I forget. I haven't taken biochem in quite a while. Um, what's interesting about this GABA um, receptor is that if you notice down in, in the second part of the picture, you have a GABA binding site. So this is where the gamma amino butyric acid molecule will bind to the receptor. And then over here, you have a benzodiazepine binding site. So this is where Valium or diazepam would bind when you take it to relieve anxiety um, or whatever you're taking it for, if it's recreational or not, you know, God be with you. But the problem with, uh, you know, a lot of barbiturates and benzodiazepines is that they're habit forming. And um, <laughs> my understanding is that alcohol and benzodiazepines are the two drugs that you can literally just die from withdrawal symptoms. 
Um, depriving your brain of these chemicals abruptly um, can kill you, whereas something like heroin, cocaine, any other hard drug doesn't really, the withdrawal is not going to kill you. It's going to be hell, but it's, uh, it won't literally kill you. So that's a GABA receptor. And then this is a more sophisticated look at it. And a lot of this stuff, you can, you can find these structures at a NCBI. Um, it's a very common um, or very open sourced uh, National Institute of like Medicine, NIH type stuff. I forget what CBI stands for. but um, So here we have the same type of thing. And, and this is, you can see all these helical structures. And this is kind of what makes them more globular is that they have much more percentage of like helical structures as opposed to you know, beta sheets, which are going to be lined up flat sheets, you know. Um, and then if you look, this bottom picture here is as if you're looking down from the top, um, like the previous slide was, um, kind of looking down on the top on the bottom here. Oh, one last thing to mention is that uh, activation of this system pumps chloride ions into the intercellular space. Um, if you, from my understanding, is that excite like if you excite a neuron, you open calcium channels, which has a positive charge to it. I don't know if there's a correlation between positive charge and excitation in neurons and negative charge, or but it seems too coincidental. So something else I can look into later. On that. Um, so if we go back to here. It's the same thing, but you're showing. Uh, more of a binding pocket. So, um, you know, right here, they're talking about the benzodiazepine receptor. It's hard, maybe hard to see, but within this structure, there's an active site. And in that active site is where, you know, your, your value molecule will come in, it will hang out, trigger the response, do the chemical and biochemical processes needed to trigger that response, and then it will release it out. And you have the dissociation content, uh, constant and stuff like that that tells you how strongly that will bind to your receptors. So the stronger it binds, um, the longer it would last in a sense. So something to keep in mind when you're, when you're <laughs> thinking about pharmaceuticals. Um, and then also you have the GABA binding sites over here. So again, there's going to be a different active site, which is what allows this site to differentiate certain molecules from let's say this site. So those binding pockets, um, back in the day when they were first discovering enzymes, we used the lock and key method. Um, that is an insufficient representation of the dynamics that proteins and enzymes, um, enzymes, excuse me, proteins are enzymes, or enzymes are proteins, but um, proteins perform catalytic functions. Um, geez, I am backwards today. Enzymes perform catalytic functions, and they are also proteins. All right. <laughs> Got that out of the way. So um, within these active sites, there might – well, not within the active sites. On the side of these sites, there might also be other sites that different molecules can bind to, and that's called like an allosteric inhibition or an allosteric um, – modulation. But basically what that does is it slightly changes the form of the protein in such a way as to either induce a better fit or, or induce a confirmation that is more selective for certain um, molecules and for that active site. So that's pretty much what I know about the GABA unit. Um, it is the main inhibitory uh, neural pathway or regulatory system in the brain. So again, if you get excited and you're all anxious, it's the GABA receptors that are, that are, that are trying to trigger as much as they can to calm that excitation down. And that's why Valium works so well, because it targets this particular receptor in general. Um, so now we talked about the receptors that we're triggering. This is valeric acid. So we know that it's an acid because we have our organic acid group right here. 
C double bond O to the OH. Um, the other functional groups within this molecule is you have uh, a double bond here. So there's your alkene group. And then you also have another double bond here. And since it's in a cyclic form, if you count around one, two, three, four, five, that would be a cyclopentene. Um, and that's just, that's just nomenclature. But what this um, molecule seems to do in the brain is modulate that, or not modulate, but uh, um, it has this, uh, that allosteric inhibit inhibitory quality to modulate the gamma receptors. Um, so this, oops, so, oops. I think I messed up. So this valeric acid, if you were to buy um, an extract um, from CVS or wherever, this is basically what they certify on the bottle to contain. So I didn't really look into it much, but whatever, 12% valeric acid. So, you know, that extract is hedging its bets that this is the only kind of bioactive molecule that matters within those extracts. And um, that is that is not true. So that's where um, that's where natural products I feel have a superior advantage over pharmaceuticals is that you get cocktails or you get different profiles of compounds um, that that have medicinal value to them. The one caveat is that if you're <laughs> If your profile or your ratios are way out of whack from what nature produces, you could have some potentially uh, delirious side effects or delirious, whatever. Uh, so this is <laughs> the narrow hall. It's hard when you start learning new molecules that you haven't said, like they just don't roll off the tongue quite as easily. <laughs> so this is <laughs> valerinol. And again, <clears throat> you can see that it's an all because you have your alcohol group right here. Whoops keep jumping around. Um, this also seemed to have uh, similar qualities to the valeric acid um, in the brain. And again, it was a sedative um, kind of, you know, just a calming effect that everyone describes it as it is. Yeah, so these two compounds are allosterically affecting the benzodiazepine receptor. And what amazed me after reading, you know, a dozen papers on this subject or so was every one of them from like 96 to like 2017 is kind of where the research research seemed to stop being as progressive. They all compared these compounds to be similar, if not as effective as uh, diazepam, which is Valium, which that's just like. Like, oh man, we've been on the wrong track for maybe too long now. <laughs> so well, that's good they're admitting it. Yeah, right. I mean, at least the research is coming out saying, ah, by the way. <laughs> um, <laughs> so these two compounds, the valeric acid. Oh, one other thing I can point out about the structure for people that are trying to decipher what this encrypted picture is, is you'll notice there's a wedge here and a dash here. So this is a methyl group because it doesn't go to anything. So it's just assumed that this is a CH3 that's off of this cyclohexane ring. Um, if you think about that molecule lying flat on the paper, then the wedge would be pointing up and the dash would be pointing like down into the table. So that's just a way to try to show some three perspective, um, uh, pers yeah, 3D perspective of a, of a molecule that you're drawing on a two-dimensional space. And if we do something on THC, like we can get into conformational analysis. Um, I don't know if I have any good examples here, but um, so yeah, the valeric acid and the veneranol are, are two um, compounds that seem to allosterically affect the um, benzodiazepine receptor in, in the GABA, in the GABA, in the GABA receptor. All right, so here's boronol. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Uh, uh, no, you go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. No problem. I'll save it. Yeah. So 
I, I, I thought this was a cool molecule to show because it shows, it, it does have medicinal value. It seems to stimulate digestion. And uh, valerian root has also been used to treat um, post um, menstrual symptoms and, and menopausal symptoms or postmenopausal symptoms. So PMS and, and postmenopausal, they found that this might be the compound in the valerian root that is helping alleviate some of the, some of the distress. Not to mention the two other um, previous compounds, which will, you know, I would assume that going through these situations puts the body under a lot of stress every month and it kind of makes people irritable or whatever. Um, again, we're, we're hitting that diazepine receptor or that benzodiazepine receptor and, and trying to just calm things down a little bit um, so that it doesn't appear that bad as, you know, I, I don't know what discomfort it is, uh, um, but, but it, it does seem to affect people's lives um, in a negative way from time to time. So this one stimulates digestion. The other two seem to, to kind of calm the GABA or to help fire the GABA receptors to calm down the system. Um, and what's interesting about this oops, what's interesting about this molecule is that it's actually a six carbon ring, one, two, three, four, five, six. And then it's got a one carbon bridgehead and then two methyls coming off of it. But this is the first time that, in, at least in this show, that we've seen a, a, a bridged um, molecule. And then again, here's your, your alcohol group that is, that is pointing, pointing like, you know, down off of the ring. Um, instead of if it was on the wedge, it'd be pointing up off of the ring. Um, so I thought that was pretty cool to show. It's just, you know, a bridge system that has medicinal properties. Uh, again, it's, they're still sifting through which is which because everyone's been focused on valeric acid for so long that um, they're kind of starting to, to move into what the other minor constituents are, just like we are in cannabis with cannabinoids. You know, five years ago, I didn't hear anyone talking about flavonoids and cannabis. And uh, about two years ago, I, I isolated some of the anthocyanins, I think. And then like a week later, everyone was talking about flavonoids. And I was like, oh, damn it. <laughs> you know, but anyways, that's <laughs> neither here nor there. <laughs> um, so here's another compound that's common to the valerian root. Ah, this is <laughs> this is just for you, Alco. So. Apparently, this isovaleric acid is what is responsible for the old man foot smell. Nice. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and and how much related to that is the effect? You know, that's where I didn't see anybody really talking about the medicinal effects of this. Nice. <laughs> so as an extractor, I was like, huh. Like, it seems like all you got to do is get rid of that and you might have a more palatable product in your tea. Um, Absolutely. So that, that was really interesting. And, and I wanted to make sure I included that because <laughs> uh, that seemed to be some of your personal experience with this. Uh, root. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and again, like uh, just to point out some of the molecular nuances, Again, we have the, the acid group, C double bond O, next to OH. The ISO is a common convention. And basically, instead of going one, two, three methyl, you know, one, two, three, four. So three methyl uh, butanoic acid, they call it isovaleric acid. And this one, oops, I gotta stop clicking the screen. This one, two, three carbons right here is what's known as the ISO group. So it's just a very common group that we just gave it its own prefix. Uh, isopropanol would be one, two, three, and then you'd have an alcohol sitting right here with nothing next to it. Um, so technically it's one, two, it would be two, <laughs> two methyl, uh, you know, ethanol or something like that, but everyone just calls it isopropanol. And that's where IUPAC gets tedious at best. Um, so there's your old man funk coming from the root or the extract. And I forgot to check that smell chart. It was probably right under the acid group too. 
<laughs> I'll do that after this. That's that's cool. <laughs> um, all right. So we talked about gamma amino butyric acid. This is an amino acid known as glutamate, and this is the precursor to uh, GABA, the GABA amino butyric acid. So you know that it's an amino acid. Don't get thrown off by these negative charges here because a proton's positive. So just pop out hydrogen there if you want. It, it's fine. Again, the positive charge on nitrogen, don't, I wouldn't stress out about that. Just look at your valency, look at your periodic table. You can remove this proton no problem and have a totally neutral amine here. What they're showing here is the Zwitter ionic form of a, um, of a protein. And that means basically that it's at, it's at such a pH that not only are you going to deprotonate the, um, the acid group, you're also gonna protonate the amine group. And uh, that's an isoelectric point. Um, it has to do with pKa's. And uh, again, that's nothing different really than a really general um, chart of pHs. So pH is only referred to uh, with the hydroxide ion and the hydronium ion, where pKa can talk about any proton. So this proton, it doesn't need a hydronium to be there. It doesn't need a hydroxide to be a base. It's, it's, um, it's a different way of thinking about um, the dissociation of a proton. And literally what it is, is a capital K in chemistry is an equilibrium constant. So what a pKa is, is the negative log of the equilibrium constant for this proton to dissociate. So that was a lot. So the big difference between pH and pKa is that pKa doesn't really have an upper bound. Well, I guess it does. So an alkane's pKa is like 50. It's not going to want to donate protons unless you do some really fancy tricks. Um, now, the pKa of an of a organic acid, if I remember correctly, is around four to six, which means that you have a much more likely chance of, um, of deprotonating an organic acid, which again, Ronsted Lowry definition of acid, um, proton donation, proton you know, or proton acceptor, proton donator, um, the lower the pKa, the more it will want to kick that off because it's the negative log. Um, so that being said, uh, same thing with this. You can have a pKb in a sense, which would be a how willing is it to, to accept the proton as a base. And um, But more, m most people only think in terms of pKa's. And an amine, if I remember correctly, is in like the mid-30s. So again, it's it, it's more willing to to donate a proton than an alkane, but it's still nowhere near you know six eight you know I think phenols are twelve. Anyways, so that's just a different way to think about pH uh, or dissociation of protons in a more general way is by using pKa. Um, so glutamate is an amino acid. Here's your amide bond right here. And I kind of drew this out. It's not super satisfying, but I don't know if you guys can see this. Oh, hold on, let me let me switch to you. Oh, okay. It takes it takes a, a little bit because we've got this screen shared. So hold on just a second. Oh, no worries. Um so is that readable? I can see it. I just got to make it to where everybody else can. Okay. <laughs> I can't get you to show up. Huh? Huh? Oh, yeah, that's pretty readable. There we go. Okay. All right. So Switch. this. Hold on, hold on, hold on. This is, it takes a. I'm not as smooth with all of this flipping everything around as Peter and uh, the other guys uh, are. And I tried to find a better picture so that I didn't have to <laughs> draw this stuff out. And it was just hard. <laughs> all right. 
Hopefully it, okay. helps, hopefully it helps clarify it once I can get it switched over. There you are. All yeah. right. Let's so, hope it's worth it. <laughs> yeah, right? So this is glutamate <laughs> that I drew by hand. And if you notice, I left a proton off of the amino group so that I could show the lone pair. Now, I drew two arrows, one from that lone pair on the nitrogen to the carbon-nitrogen bond next to it. And then I drew another arrow showing that carbonyl group moving from a C double bond O and moving those electrons up. And that's on this left-hand side. And then on the right-hand side is the different picture. So this is called resonance. And this is another uh, invention or calculation that was done by Pauling. And what resonance does, um, are we still on the slide as well? Yeah, I'll, I'll highlight yeah, so, that now. So what resonance does is it's always a stabilizing effect. And what it is, is mathematically, these orbitals can overlap in various different ways to produce the double bond here and a single bond here. But it's not favorable um, because you're going to still have a positive charge on the nitrogen. And now you have a negative charge. And these are formal charges. So they're not like... Um, dipoles. These are on the molecule negatively charged. Um, and then you'll also have another negative charge up here. So all you've done is created more separation of charges, which is not a stabilizing effect. Yet, if you, if you mathematically add that picture to the more stable picture, then overall the picture gets more stable. I hope that made sense because it's gonna lead into the synthesis of, of GABA. And actually yeah, something that's, that's very, very very common in, in the cannabis lingo is, you know, we're gonna decarboxylate glutamate to make GABA. So I just wanted to show that if I draw a different picture, I can put a formal negative charge on this oxygen, a formal negative charge on this oxygen. And then if it's NH2 with a double bond here, I'm still gonna have that plus ch charge here. <clears throat> So now if we look at, this is gamma amino butyric acid. So here's your amine group, NH2, alpha, beta, delta, gamma, butyric acid. So that's where the gamma comes from. Here's the acid group, the amino, actually priority wise, it's probably alpha, beta, delta, gamma, and now it's gamma amino butyric acid. Since the acid is at the end, the acid group took priority when I was naming this, this compound. So I apologize for going backwards with that. But if we go back to this slide here, all we've done is here's a carbon, here's an oxygen, here's an oxygen, CO2. So we decarboxylated the glutamate and uh, the body does this by using what's called a decarboxylase. Um, and that's an enzyme that will essentially perform this decarboxylation um, step in your body so that it makes it, you know, it transforms it into something that's different. It gives you, it gives you a more vast library of, of uh, compounds that you can choose from or the body can choose from it and depending on its needs and demands. So this is, again, amino acid, amid bond. We're going to decarboxylate this amino acid and we're gonna get gamma amino butyric acid. This is the neurotransmitter that is native in the brain and is what is triggering your GABA receptors. And this is where lock and key model once again fails because as we just showed, you know, valeric acid seems to be able to bind in certain areas. So it's, I guess it's unclear to me whether the allosteric modulation there um, or the all allosteric interaction is allowing GABA to bind more easily or more specifically or for longer. And that's where, again, induced fit potentially could explain all of those um, questions. Um, oh, and one thing I would like to say um, 
before I go too far into the extractions and stuff like that is that I'm not a medical doctor or anything like that. I'm not giving medical advice. This is strictly peer reviewed literature that the scientists did. And I'm just trying to digest it and interpret it and, and, and share my thoughts with it on you, with you guys. So please don't take this as me medical advice. Um, consult your doctor for sure. So the big thing is that we've gone through all these molecules and four or five of them, one, two, three, four, they were all found in, in the valerian root. So now we want to maybe try to extract and isolate these and make a tea or a tincture. You know, the other possibility uh, for the home extractor would be uh, some type of lipid extraction with olive oil or coconut oil or butter or whatever. But um, yeah, you, you mentioned that uh, in, in your message to me before we did this show. And uh, while you're on that, what would be what, what do you think would be the benefit for taking that route with it? With the fat soluble? Yes. So when I look at this guy, the only area of polarity that I have is right here. This is the only place I got lone electrons. I got some delta positive. So I got partial net or delta negative. So I got some partial negative charges over here. All of this stuff would, would be fat soluble. Okay. So that's, um, that's why you, all right. So it, this stuff is a lot like weed in many, many ways. It's, it's kind of strange. Like effect wise. Yeah. Effect wise. And like, yeah. it's a uh, fat soluble, like uh, there's not, uh, there's not a lot of, uh, substances out there. It's like the reason that, uh, weed people have been stuck in like, uh, service jobs for a lot of, uh, the past few decades is because it stays in your system so goddamn long. But the right. people that are on all of the bullshit, <laughs> the, the meth yeah. heads and everything, the meth heads can get a job any day they want because it's going through their system so fast. So I was just, it's just interesting to me that all of like the right. stuff that's kind of uh, helpful for you and but they all kind of slow you down too. It's like opium, valerian and uh, cannabis are all fat soluble things that stick in yeah. your system forever. And anyway, it's just. I, 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 I always like, I, I'm not, I don't look at the world like you do because I don't have your uh, education, but I do make connections. So when <laughs> stuff like that, like it, uh, approaches me, it's like, I immediately see the connections there. So sorry for interrupting. That's a, that's oh. a good answer though. Oh, Thank that you. was per that was perfect. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, how long is that meth head going to keep the job, though? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> this pot, it'll show up, man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> So, so, yeah, that's where I think uh, in, in a way that lipid extraction, you know, cannabis is not this molecule or THCA rather is not this molecule. It's a little bit bigger. Um, it's got a couple more things to it. But, man, from my experience, uh, low temperature extractions with uh, high, high octane ethanol is is a really good extraction technique. Um, like it, and this is where. As a chemist, I, what I really like to convey to people is, you know, you don't have to buy the name brand stuff. Just go to your liquor store and get some Everclear. Um, you don't like, uh, oh, for instance, Clear Res is a really popular disinfectant uh, used in like uh, cloning machines, like the aeroponic cloning machines or whatever. And uh, I looked at the back of the bottle and it's just calcium perchlorate or whatever, or hypochlorate. So it's basically a calcium version of bottled bleach. Well, you can go to any pool store in this country and buy that calcium version of your commercial grade bleach and save yourself like hundreds of dollars a year. I mean, they're selling that clear for 120 bucks a gallon and I can make it for about 12 cents. So that's just another interesting little thing about if you can go down this hole and start and start looking at molecules in a way, then you can even save yourself a bunch of money at your grow or your personal tent or whatever you're doing, but uh, extraction wise. So when I looked into it, they basically water extraction is the most popular. So they're making teas out of them, you know, and whenever you want to make a tea, you never really want to actually boil the root, you know, extraction of natural products is at the forefront, extremely straightforward. 
Well, it looks pretty, uh, you know, non-soluble in water. So I'm going to try something that doesn't have as much polarity. I'll try ethanol, you know, that's food grade. Let's try that first. But long story short is if you use water, you want to gently simmer this stuff. And what I would pay attention to is duration. So you get your water and if it's simmering, you know that it's at about 100 degrees unless you're at elevation. Uh, for instance, water boils around here at like 96 and a half degrees. So you want to be gentle when you extract this stuff. And I think that's why like Korean natural farming, they extract this stuff for like months and months and months. A, they know they got everything and B, it was, they didn't degrade anything because when you add heat, you can start breaking these things down and getting undesirable side products or degraded products that aren't, aren't desirable. Which again, I think the power of people having this plant and being able to extract it themselves is now you're not having to deal with prepackaged um, products that were tested six months ago before, and they get to the shelf and you buy it, you don't know what has changed in that bottle since it was packaged or tested. So, you know, omega-3 fatty acids are a really classic example, I guess, of where people are taking these as supplements, but when you look at what's actually in the pill, it's not what you're buying. So my answer to that is, well, eat more fatty fish then, you know, kind of kind of mentality or take your fatty fish. And if you want to go through the process of extracting the omega-3 so you can bottle it up, at least you know that it's fresh. So, again, just some things that I think chemistry can maybe add to the, uh, I don't know, the modern homesteader. Um, <laughs> but anyways, um, yeah, so. I would gently boil this in water and figure out the effects of it. As far as a dose goes, everything I read, and this is from um, Native American Apocryphy books to peer reviewed literature, is around 300 milligrams to 900 milligrams of the raw root. So that poses some, so like if you want to make a capsule, no problem, right? You get a, you got a pretty good scale, uh, maybe for a hundred bucks or whatever that goes to, you know, the 10 milligrams or whatnot, You'll probably get them for 20 bucks at a head shop. I don't know. Um, and then you fill your capsule and you can just take that as a, as a daily supplement if you wanted to, um, or a nightly supplement in most cases. Um, if you're trying to treat insomnia, it's recommended to take this for about two weeks uh, at bedtime. And then certain papers were even talking about um, basically backing off for a week and not taking it and then restarting it again. And it kind of made sense when you think about how neurons and receptors work is if you're constantly triggering that response, you, you desensitize it. And this is why like heroin is so addictive is because it's such a great rush on the front end but the more and more you use it, the more and more those, you know, those, those neurons are just like, hey, man, like, give me a break. I need to recover here. So I think that's why they, they're kind of cycling um, uh, the administration of it. Um, I, I read nothing that it's harmful to take every day. There was one paper that mentioned some rare cases of, um, of a liver toxicity. And in the next sentence, they went on to say that since this is such a common over-the-counter product, we don't really feel like this is a, a major issue um, because it's not cropping up in societies at a high enough percentage. So, you know, take that again, take that as you will. If you're a heavy drinker, it might not be the best supplement right away. Um, so anyways, yeah, generally, generally simmering, um, I read 30 minutes, um, you know, most teas are four to five minutes, but they're also very loose leaf. So you have a big surface area. So the more you grind this herb up, two things happen. The more you increase the surface area, the more efficient the extraction will be, but that can be a double-edged sword as well. Just because my extraction is efficient or it gives me a high yield, it doesn't mean it's selective or at least pulling out the product that I really want to get. And when you're doing, 
you know, broad spectrum extractions with ethanol or water, um, you can grind things too small. Uh, if anyone's ever tried to extract trim from an auto trimmer, it's, it's a nightmare. A, you knock all the trichomes off right away from the mechanical process. And B, you chop up the leaf so much that I can now pull all the chlorophyll that I want out of, out of any given you know, gram of it. Instead of having a little bit more surface area and trying to knock the trichome off, and like kind of capture it before I pull the chlorophyll through as well. Um, and that's where low temperatures can help you. So water, yeah, I would gently simmer. Again, four, three to 900 milligrams is, a, is an average dose. In my experience, I always go low and work up. Um, yes. <laughs> makes sense to me. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. So if I was going to play around with this and make capsules because of that isovaleric acid taste, um, I would probably make like 200 milligram capsules and then try one a night for, you know, and then, and then you can go right to two if it's not doing anything. And then you're right within that, that lower threshold of, um, of medicinal properties. Um, so again, yeah, water gently simmer. This guy, same thing. You got the alcohol group, so it's not going to be quite as polar. So again, if you're trying to get venerinol, it might be better to go a more non-polar solute. And but honestly, it's it's not going to change drastically. If you wanted to put, pump this into an HPLC or a high performance high performance liquid chromatography machine and run it through the column and separate these compounds, then yes, on a quantitative level, your solvent is going to matter. But qualitatively, uh, for broad spectrum product from Valerian root, I think that uh, that they would extract nicely, like co-extract nicely together. Um, let's see, the Boronel or the oops, the Boronel. It's a little different. I, I've never extracted a bridge compound before, so I don't know what quarks you're going to run into there. But again, you got the alcohol group, so it's got some polarity, um, and you know, to kind of jump back to like PKAs or more or less equilibrium constants is if you want to get more out of your root, simmer it in a batch of like 100 mils of water or whatever, strain it, do another 100 mils of water, you know, and get it back to that simmer for the same amount of time, strain it, and then do it one more time. And you'll get like a quantitative extraction in the sense that that you, every time, so if the first round you pulled 50% of the material out, you have 50% left in the, in the root and 50% of it in the water. Then the next round, you're gonna pull another 50% of that out, hopefully. So now you're gonna have 25% left in the root and then 75% in your extracted liquor or, or your mother liquor or your water or whatever. And then if you go one more time and you get 50% of that 25%, now you pulled another 12 and a half percent into your 75 per, or into that water. You add all like a back cross. What? This is like a back cross. You're describing how if oh, you're back crossing sure. a plant. <laughs> so so right a lot of this audience understands exactly what you're describing here. I'm Beautiful. sorry to interrupt, but <laughs> no, no, perfect. Yeah. So in chemistry, we call that the partition coefficient. But at the end of the day, you could keep doing it and right, you get diminishing returns. So 87 and a half percent. You know, I'm not going to waste my time for another 6%. And I guess in back crossing would be more like genetic stability or something. Yes. Well, yeah, you're eventually going to fuck up if you keep going and going and going like that. So, yeah, you're in, in both cases, it seems like you're just heading down a bad road once you get to a certain point. Yeah. And in the extraction world, it's just it's a waste of time. I, I don't yeah. care about that last 6%. Like, you know, if I do, then I'm going to try to modify my method or change my solvent. So that I'm getting 60% on my first, you know, and then 30 and then 15. But anyways, that, that's really cool that that uh, crossed over a little bit. Nice. Yeah, there's a, everybody that, that back crosses to a certain point. There's only been a few people that have done it, but they, they all say that after a certain level, it just, like you said, it's a waste of time and breeding is very time consuming. It's not like what you're up to, man. You can, you can do your shit in an afternoon. <laughs> yeah. 
That is the luxury <laughs> of Cameron Street for sure. And I think the growers get really pissed at me sometimes because it looks like I'm lazy. <laughs> but I'm like, man, I, you know, I got a half pound of shatter right here. Like, I don't know what you're talking <laughs> about. <But anyways, laughs> um, that's so as a as a really weird tangent, if you don't mind, do you know anything about like the solar storm strain? No, I've never even okay. heard of that. All right, yeah, maybe, maybe uh Sometime we can talk about that because when I looked into the genetics, it looks like it's back crossed with like everything in the kitchen sink. Hmm. And I was just like, I've just never seen that complicated of uh, a bread plant, I guess. It was like just everything going every like Astro dog to chem dog to blah, 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 blah. And I was like, whoa, hmm. <laughs> this is getting pretty heady. <laughs> Maybe that's why they named it after a star. Yeah, right. I'm like, we're done with this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I don't. Um, well, if you, uh, if you could go back to that uh, booth, a uh, 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 new word. I meant to write it down the last time it was on the screen. The men that one, the menstrual cramp thing. The oh, uh, yeah, the boronol. Boronol. Yeah, the type of compound that you said that you've never extracted before. And of course, that oh, would be uh, the one that my my wife would be most interested in. Yeah, it's, it's, she has very, very bad uh, cramps sometimes, and we've tried all kinds of different stuff. And uh, the valerian, she does, she's never taken the valerian for that. She, uh, that's other things. I was going to talk about that later on, but uh, let's stick on this right now. So uh, I did read more about. Uh, uh, I didn't get to this compound, but I did. I did look in more into uh, the menstrual aspects of this plant after reading your uh letter to me and it's like i said they didn't mention that it that they had uh narrowed it down to this compound right here that's mostly responsible for it so it's like uh i guess what i'm getting at here is uh what would be the you said you've never done this before what what kind of complications do you see popping up if you tried um I think heat will be your enemy. Mm. You might start busting up the molecule. So like a salt hole extraction where you're constantly like um, refluxing solvent through through like a, a porous, basically a thimble, a porous thimble. Um, you might start degrading the product. Again, you know, just at face value, you got that one hydroxyl group that's polar this stuff up here is going to be all non-polar. Um, so if I was in a lab, what I would do is take valerian root, you know, prep it, maybe even, maybe even lyophilize it to remove whatever water was in there. And then I would do basically three different extractions. I would do one with hexane. You know, wash it three times with hexane, fresh hexane. And then I would take that organic fraction and try to figure out what's in there. And then I would move into like, let's say ethanol and then wash it the, the same material again that I washed with hexane. I would wash it three times with ethanol. And then I would put the ethanol fraction in its own little beaker. And then finally, you know, I don't know if I'd go with straight water, but maybe 80%. Uh, ethanol to water or or some ratio of that, 60-40, something like that. And then I would take that aqueous layer and try to, to figure out what to do with that. So if I was in a kitchen, you know, the problem is, the, the nice thing about hexane is that once you extract it, the material is dry, you know, it, uh, within minutes or maybe an hour. Um, and once you extract it with ethanol, now, now it takes time to dry, which is why you don't extract with water first and then hexane, because um, you'll just get a lot of water in your hexane as well. So if you're trying to isolate this compound, my first bet would be to go with Everclear. Um, That's what we've used in the past every time. Now, what, how did the teas work? Oh, we would just like take a few uh, drops of the tincture like this, this stuff. But like I said, she's never used it for this purpose. We didn't know this until just the other day when I read your uh, your stuff last week. 
Okay. So this is all new information that right. she's like, if, if it did help her cramps in the past, she probably didn't equate it with the valerian because she was, it, uh, she uses the valerian mostly for anxiety more than the sleep aid because it works for both. And you can function during the day on it if you don't take too much. But uh, yes. so like the, we, I've, I use it for a sleep aid more than she does. She uses it more for anxiety and she flies more than I do. So she like before flights, she'll take right. a little bit of the, She'll take the tincture with her. And she's like, while she's on the flight, she'll just be putting little drops in, you know, cause she's, she's anxious right. like that. As, but uh, so it, that's that you just made me very excited and she'll be happy to hear it too, <laughs> that this can be done with Everclear. We've been doing it the right way. Or is there more? Am I interrupting uh you? <laughs> no, uh, no, I totally agree. Um, you know, I guess, like, do you have experience with, with boiling it or simmering it in water at all versus the tension? Uh, no. like, have you noticed the effects differences? No, we've never tried that because, I, I, as I said, the, the, the taste <laughs> and the smell of it is just, it's too, way too much. When you, do, when you do it like that, it's just like it, it's distracting right? because then it's in you and like you can't get it out of your palate so like everything gotcha. tastes like it and so yeah it's like we, that, that only happened once <laughs> it's much better uh, to like drop it on the back of your tongue to where it doesn't it doesn't affect you like that and the alcohol kind of knocks it back a little bit right and um it might <laughs> Nah, probably not. Um, yeah, right. The alcohol will just kind of knock the taste down a bit. And, yeah. Um, you know, the other, the, the most, I guess the most obvious answer is to gently grind this up into a capsule. Because then at that stage, you know that whatever concentration of, of boronol is in there, um, it's probably in the capsule as well. And there might be a testing facility. I, I haven't heard of a natural product testing facility. I mean, obviously for cannabis, everything is tested, but it'd be really fascinating to, to basically make a capsule, send it off to a lab, shoot it into an HPLC and, and kind of see what comes out. Um, my, my understanding is that this is a minor component. So again, you know, the German commissioner of health or whatever, this is how this percentage of valeric acid is how they certify that it's a valerian extract. Um, so no one's really looking at this compound from what I saw yet. And like I said, there was just those couple blips on PMS and, and menopause. But um, yeah, I would keep trying it with yeah, the tincture. It's... Yeah, she's gonna love this. It's a thanks, Sean. Yeah, no it's, problem. We, um, we had this other plant. There's a cranberry bush. I don't know if you've ever heard of a cranberry bush, and it didn't work. <laughs> it, it, it took forever for me to get this thing growing and get the product off of it, and she, she just said it tasted bitter. <laughs> so it didn't didn't work the way that it was supposed to. And, and I know that I got the right plant, but anyway uh, so this has been a journey for us and it's like uh no type of uh cannabis really really touches it interesting but uh yeah as like i said if the valerian has helped her in the past she she didn't make the connection that that's what it was i, I mean that would be a super difficult connection because you're taking it for sleep right and then all of a sudden you're like oh it's not so bad this month or whatever <laughs> and so, oh, i guess it's just that kind of month or you know whatever but that's fat. Yeah, I'll look into that because, um, yeah, when it started talking about how it facilitates like digestion and blood circulation, you know, I was like, well, what about things like high blood pressure as well? Um, yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, it's it, it's crazy how <laughs> when you look at a compound and you go, oh, it treats anxiety or whatever the ailment may be. Um, and then you look at how it works or whatever, and it's just so interconnected with the co-evolution of, of us and plants or plants and us, I guess is a better way to put it, to provide all these medicinal compounds for us to use. And then it's, it, it's totally lost now because 
it's no, I need an isolated product. I need volume. I, I don't want an extract. I want volume. And it's like, uh, but <laughs> you know, Woodward um, is probably one of the most revered organic synthesis in the 20th, 20th century. What was it? 1940 to 1970. He did a bunch of work on natural product synthesis. And uh, he's the first one to, to synthesize uh, lysergic acid, LSD. And uh, ever since then, we seem to be progressing towards this higher potency, uh, higher binding affinity, longer lasting, um, pure product than we are about looking at combinations of, you know, natural products, whether they're synthesized or not. If it's the same compound, I don't know if that's a huge deal, but um, Again, it's not it's not it's not THC. It's the cannabinoid profile that gives a desired response, or the terpene profile, and that's where I really hope that people can take at least that away. That that um, you know, isolated products they're only as good as as the studies behind them, and it's a scary thing to take a take a new pill that's been on the market for two years with five years of research behind it and go, well, yeah, but what about the other 40 years of my life? If like, so anyways, that's just a little bit of a ramble. <laughs> um, I apologize, but yeah, that, I'll look into that more um, on, uh, on natural, you know, relief from PMS and menopausal type symptoms. Um, Cause it does seem to be oh. a big deal for, for, 60% of the population, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. As, uh, I, uh, that's the most pain that I ever see her in. She, she also has this uh, thing with her ear that she that gives her a lot of pain too. But that, that when, when she has a bad month, it's like uh, I've almost taken her to the emergency room before because of it. It's like she's, she's in that bad of shape. Like the only reason that she didn't go is because she told me she wasn't going <laughs> so, because it, it, anyway, it, it, she looked bad. It's, it, that, it does like what you were talking about. It's blood flow. And it really seems like that, that there's like a, a, it, well, it is clotting, you know? So it, it like right. disturbs blood flow in a major way. And that's, that's what it looks like is happening to her body. Cause she starts like turning blue in places and shit, you know? So it's like, it, oh, this wow. is serious. So you, yeah, you, yeah it, something like this could be really helpful for, uh, uh, like you said, 60% of the population. So, and anyway, as. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's straight up my male ignorance and, and not really, uh, <laughs> dating that often, I guess, and whatnot. But uh, yeah, I mean, that that sounds like a really, really, really terrible time. <laughs> yeah, it's scary for everyone around her. This has been happening to her since she was a teenager. So her mom knows about it. We were just talking right. about this kind of thing recently. And what you were talking about, this synergistic effect with cannabis. Are, are you done with your slides where we can like talk to each other? Yeah, yeah for sure. Are, are yeah, there yeah. more slides? Okay, cool. Yeah, it ended up rather abruptly. I didn't really have a conclusion to the to the presentation, but oh, that's uh, all good, man. That's yeah. That's, <laughs> I, I, you were you were going back and referencing the compounds when you were talking about extracting them and and whatnot. So uh, anyway, uh, so that there was a a, a few things that uh, you didn't touch on about this plant that I, I've had experience with it, so uh, quite a bit of it, and. Uh, in the letter that you sent me before the show, it talks about how this uh, the the GABA system has a lot to do with the senses, the uh, sight, taste, and smell, and all of that. Uh, and, so, uh, just real quick, G coupled protein receptors or G coupled proteins, okay. and GABA is a G coupled protein. Gotcha. See, that's Does that that's, make sense? That, that's why you talk to a man that's educated. You misspeak and they correct you. So that's a, that's been happening to me a lot lately. <laughs> so oh. <laughs> uh, I'm not upset about it at all. But <laughs> that, yeah, but <laughs> what, what I'm getting at is uh, the what I use. I mentioned before that I, when I use valerian, it's as the sleep aid, and my wife uses it <laughs> for anxiety mostly. And yep. 
what I, I don't, the only time that I need a sleep aid is when I uh, have quit cannabis in the past. So Valerian has helped me with sleeping because it's just my mind will not stop. And uh, Valerian helps the mind stop. But uh, the dreams, the dreams on Valerian, oh. like are, they're insane. Like, and you, you, you see, taste and smell things. You don't hear so much. But it, it, it really uh, like rang true when I was reading that in that uh, information that you sent. I was like, that, that makes a hell of a lot of sense because the dream is like when you quit cannabis, you start dream. Me personally, I start dreaming more anyway, even if I'm not uh, taking the valerian. But you, you see the difference if you take that valerian and you're not smoking cannabis. And it's like you're you're in a real alternate universe like you it feels like you're there it's like astral projection silver cord kind of deal and not to get too woo woo but it's it, it really is it's like uh what they would call lucid dreaming it's what they describe oh. lucid dreaming as because you're you're there and you're troll and your 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 senses are heightened more than it is in a normal dream so it's very fascinating. It's like listening to all of this brain chemistry that you were talking about earlier and making the correlations with my experiences. Like, damn right, that's that's exactly what it does. So, uh, yeah, I mean, dreaming uh, the chemistry of dreaming. Oof. <laughs> that would be intense to go down. I might <laughs> might do that this weekend. But um, I actually, interestingly, was talking to a friend of mine over a pint a couple nights ago. And I was, I was telling him, oh, you know, I'm going to be talking about Valerian um, on this podcast or vlog or whatever. And um, he's like, oh, yeah, I used to take that. I got the craziest dreams on it. And I was like, oh, okay. So that's good to know. So that's a side effect. <laughs> um, and then, you know, another thing was uh, I dabbled around with, like, mixing melatonin and THC to make, like, a sleep aid. And that gave me some pretty crazy dreams too. So, and then I found out that, that, that cannabis actually helps to modulate circadian rhythms and production of melatonin and, and whatnot. I'm like, I probably shouldn't have to mix those two together anymore, I guess. But now yeah. have you found like, so anxiety, like what I read is anxiety is more of like um, smaller doses continuously throughout the day. Um, like kind of like your wife was was doing, like, you know, maybe a 200 milligram capsule instead of four or an eight. And um, that's supposed to help with anxiety. Um, does she end up with like that lucid dreaming type? Yeah, uh, but she's she's a lot darker than I am. So it's a little bit more unpleasant for her. <laughs> yeah. so she's, right. she's got a little bit of a darker outlook on life. Lucid dreaming for her isn't as fun as it is for me. <laughs> Yeah, right. I mean, it's uh, it's it's analogous maybe to like mushrooms, kind of being like awakened dreaming, where you're like, "Oh, this is a good one. This is a bad one. Like, I don't want to be here anymore." <laughs> and you can't wake up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that's yeah, for so sure. Sometimes mushrooms will send you into your head deep. Oof, right. Uh, somebody mentioned blue lotus over here that's how she started like before we got the valerian uh plant or found out about valerian uh she would uh, use blue lotus for this that was her her flight tincture she would take the drops of blue lotus on her wherever she was going in the country but uh that became hard to get in like a, a safe and like good form like you did it like the the place where she trusted getting it from and uh, good quality something happened with them just like disappeared on her so she tried some other stuff and it just like it didn't like it just wasn't right you know I, I so and blue lotus is not wasn't something that like that's really complex i could grow it like i've grown aquatic plants in the past but that's going to be a, a very complicated endeavor and that's when we, if, as i was researching to solve this problem for her so we found the valerian and i asked some of my uh my aunts were still around at that time and I asked them about it and they said oh yeah i got a pretty good education in this stuff from them and like it so yeah that's that's how we ended up with the valerian was she started with blue lotus and then couldn't get it anymore because it's exotic yeah and you know Same that's effect. the one that's the one drawback with natural products um 
sometimes it's just not feasible to to have a you know a cash crop that's that's able to extract um, other desirable stuffs. Uh, you know, look at the taxol. It's a very common anti-cancer agent. Um, I want to say it's from the, the yaw bark or something like that. It's from the bark of a tree. And I think I talked about that last time where you deforest the whole forest just to treat cancer. And you're like, well, that's not great. So that's where the lab can be useful. But um, that's really, wow, man. Uh, I'm glad that I found those articles because I kind of feel like maybe you've got another episode up your sleeve already. We, we can, uh, uh, good, good, good. Cause I, I want to do as many of these as you're willing to do, man, because I love picking your brain. And it's like, even if all of that, like uh, all of the bonds and uh, all of that stuff that you were talking about earlier, like uh, that, that kind of thing is useful for me in a lot of other ways. Like maybe uh, it, because it's universal, it's just how it fucking works. You know, like how you were relating that uh, the I can't remember the acronym that you were using, but you're analogous to pH. Same sort of deal, oh, okay. different uh, elements involved. Yes, yes, that. Yeah. So yeah, it, I, mean, uh, pH, I just. Yeah, pH is a K.A. Um, you know, it, yeah. I, God, man, I'm, I'm really glad I stumbled upon this route because it's opened up like personally, I'm going to. Oh, hold on one second. Gotcha. All right. So I, I hope everybody else is enjoying this as, as much as I do. I, I really, I'm glad this man reached out to me and is, is willing to come here and share his knowledge with us. So it's not, it hasn't really popped yet, but this is my Valerian right uh, here. <laughs> So you can't really yeah. see it, but then uh, going down this road, I was like, I need to have this plant in my life potentially because I suffer from crippling anxiety that, you know, it's hard to work and it's hard to, you know, do stuff. And I'm like, if this plant can just knock down 10% of it, at least I can get through my day every day, you know? Um, and again, nice. like that, I'd rather knock it down 10% than be drooling on myself because of Valium. You know? I just that's my personal belief system. <laughs> um, that's what there. But yeah, I was a little, I was, I was pretty excited. Like I got a little nub to show, and I'm like, ah, no one's gonna be able to see that. <laughs> but anyways, so yeah, if you got other plans, I'm glad it's donated for you. Yeah. There, there, you know, this plant has been bred. There, there is a like a, a source out there, and I, I'm imagining that they went for the valeric acid. Is but they there is a, it's a strictly yeah. medicinal seeds is the place that has the the seed line, and I think that they did it themselves. Is they they have a valerian that's like a little bit more potent than the normal aficionado. I can't remember what they called it, but they they have something a little different. They offer both, but they have that thing that they made. So like I, I should have looked that up valerian. before the show. Yeah, the high octane valeria, and you know it's high octane enough, man. It's it, uh, a lot. It's it's called a mild sedative, but I yeah. I wouldn't say I I think it's pretty powerful. It's it. Uh, somebody in the comments earlier said that they saw somebody messed up on the stuff before, and I I believe you like take too much of it. I could imagine it like it, and I bet it wouldn't be pleasant. Like I couldn't <laughs> imagine it would be like it. Like taking uh, like too much Benadryl or something is probably what it would be analogous to. That's what I would imagine it would feel like if you took too much. So right. Anybody that's done that. <laughs> and, you know, another paper, this is just as effective for, for sleeping or uh, uh, promoting sleep as Benadryl is. So, you know, some people take that for sleep. It was it dihydrofedramine or something like that? I, I forget. Um, so, yeah, whatever it is, but everything, everything I read is that whatever we're buying on the shelves to help us relax or sleep, this, this plant seems to be able to, uh, to perform similar functions. So very, very yeah. interesting stuff. Yeah. That's the, yeah. Uh, what, what else do I have over here in my notes? Oh, I don't know if I'm going to, you brought up something very interesting. I think I'll talk to you about that. Talk to you with about that after the show uh, but uh cats there there uh cats love this stuff i don't know yeah, i don't know if they love it 
Yeah, yeah, but uh, what I'm about to say is like, like I said, I've had this uh, plant out here for about five or six years now, and in the winter time, it's obviously gone, and you just got the nub there, the crown. The cats all winter long are back there, like rolling on it and like scratching at it and peeing on it, and I think they poop around it. They don't poop on it, but they poop around it, and it's like, I don't know if they like it or not. I don't think it's. I, it may give them the same uh, effect as the nephthalone or whatever that's the stuff in the uh, catnip is, but I think that they're trying to mark it because cats are very territorial and they like to mark everything. Like uh, every corner in this house has like one of those little like cat mouth marks on it, and you clean it off, and like a month or two later, they've got them all nastied up again. As people in the people in the uh, chat that have cats. I don't know if you do, Sean, but that's a, <laughs> this is a thing is they're very into marking things. And I don't I don't know if they like the valerian or not. It seems to me from what I've seen is that they don't like it and they're trying to mark it. But people see them acting like it's uh, like they do on catnip and have kind of made that correlation. I could be completely wrong on that, but it, 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 it to me, it looks like they don't like it because they don't poop and piss on catnip. You see, you know what I'm saying? Because we have catnip out there too, and they don't do that to that. But that right, valerian right. root all winter long, they're all over it, and it's all of the outdoor cats doing it, boys and girls. And yeah, I mean, isn't 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 like cat urine really high in urea, or or, or yeah, some it, other nitrogen yeah, compound? Got a lot of ammonia. <laughs> it smells like right that cat piss smell. You're like, oh god, cat, You're never <laughs> gonna get that out of the rug, you know. Um, yeah, right. Like they were trying to over fertilize it. <laughs> Get out of my yard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh man. This is, uh, yeah. They they the scientists know more than I do, obviously. But my observation, it doesn't seem like they like it at all. <laughs> it seems yeah. like they don't like it. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's you know the last thing the that things I did... you... Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. The last thing I did run upon, just real quick is um you know valerian root mixed with lemon balm and valerian root mixed with hops have also showed um really promising results the valerian and lemon balm combination i found a paper basically saying it, it was pretty much effective against adhd symptoms um so that's another thing that I just wanted, that was the last thing that I kind of forgot to write down was that um, in tandem, valerian root with lemon balm or hops are the two classic ones. You can get even more uh, desirable effects to manage uh, a multitude of symptoms, not just ones that may arise from, let's say the GABA receptor. So I almost forgot that. Huh. I just wanted I, to shout it out there. I've got a bunch of that out there too. We got tons of it. it spreads around everywhere lemon balm it, and ours is really strong it smells like pledge like lemon pledge like house cleaner stuff it's a right. really really strong I, I bet they stumbled upon that trying to get rid of the taste they mixed it with that lemon balm it was like oh yeah <laughs> that's not so bad <laughs> i could do this every day <laughs> yeah <laughs> the double down um, on the comp because I have made lemon balm tea. That's why we have that stuff around, and that's calming too. It's very not quite like valerian, but it's it's calming. Yeah. It, so that that's really cool. That this that we're gonna have to try that. I didn't pick up on that. And and it that's might cool. be more of a uh, anxiety approach too, where you can back off on the valerian, bump up the lemon balm, or introduce the lemon balm to back off on the valerian, so that it's not quite as sedative, but. You know, maybe it still has that calming undertone to it um, from a formulation standpoint of like a nutraceutical or whatever. Awesome. Awesome. That's, uh, I don't know how to say this person's name, but they made a pretty good joke about the uh, cats peeing on the valerian. Let's see. If, wake up my mouse here. Come on. Show it. Why is everything taking... No, it's not popping up on the screen. Do you all see a comment down at the bottom of the screen? About cats? No. It's H7 Opolo. I'm trying to... Lar, pineapple weed. <laughs> Why do you appreciate my play Weird. on words? So it's somewhere, yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> As, uh, I'm not good at running this show. There it is. Finally got it up there. They combine the two words, valerian and urine. <laughs> oh, there it is. Val, 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 val so, urine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's what uh, that's what I might start calling mine out there because uh, they pee on it all all winter long. <laughs> Maybe you can brand it. <laughs> yeah. The best of the best. <laughs> I got the cat piss strain. Yeah. <laughs> start a fight. The authentic campus. Oh, oh yeah, somebody, <laughs> somebody's on it already. So, all right, man. Uh, is anything else that you you want to cover on, on this plan, or you want to talk about some other shit? Is it? I've, I've got some things on my mind. I won't get too controversial, but uh, so, uh, some people were giving me some shit yesterday, and I'd kind of like to address that. <laughs> sure, I got I got some time. All right. It, because you're a smart dude. The reason I want to talk to you about this is, uh, you, do you fish? Did I finish? Do you fish? Like fishing? Oh, do I fish? You go uh, fishing? Yeah, from time to time. Yeah. Uh, mostly when I'm backpacking and like uh, to catch food. But yeah. Sweet. Oh, cool, man. That's. Tell me about that. Where you go backpacking, where you're like catching your own food and stuff. That's a lot better oh, than I mean, packing it in. That's for sure. It's a lot lighter. That's for sure. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, me, me and a friend from high school, we used to, we used to tour some national parks. And uh, um, so Yellowstone, Glacier, Olympic, Yosemite. I don't, I don't think I fished in Yosemite, but I mean, I'm about right now I'm about 10 minutes from the Yellowstone river and about, an hour from the Gallatin River, so you know we got some amazing fly fishing out here, and it's uh it's pretty easy to to catch fish that you can actually eat. <laughs> so nice, clean water. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. <clears throat> so that's, that's that's I'm gonna talk about unclean water because where I'm at, water ain't clean. All right. right. So that's uh, the reason I was asking you about fishing is because. Uh, uh, did you grow up fishing? Like, did you go fishing when you were a kid and all of that? Or is it like something you picked up when you were older? No, I kind of picked it up, uh, you know, trying to fit in when you move into a new town, everyone's fishing. You're like, all right, I'll try it. You know, yeah, I'll go on the boat for a day or whatever. But yeah, that's, I got pretty limited experience with fishing. Okay. I gotcha. Uh, but you know, uh, elements. So that's, that's where I'm headed with this is, uh, yesterday is, uh, there, there was a debate debate happening on the chat on the, uh, the soil show. And, uh, I brought up the around here that I live in a place where you can uh, fish with shotguns. Like you can, <laughs> you can just fire, you fire a shotgun into the water and you're eating for a week. Yeah. But, uh, uh, immediately people is like, Oh, you're not putting lead shot into the water. Are you okay? Da, 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 all of that, you know? Okay. Well, I grew up fishing. Right. And, uh, when you, when you grow up fishing, you put these little lead weights on the, uh, on the line. And when you're a kid, you like throw it out into like, you're trying to catch fish by the logs. Everybody's telling you you catch the fish by yeah, the logs. So you're throwing them out and you're getting hung up. You're breaking your line and that lead's going into the water. You're putting more on another line, throwing it out there and doing this over and over again. Okay. And you see where I'm going with this. All right. Yeah. So I'm just trying to make people think <laughs> about like, uh, uh, human effects. All right. Now, uh, I, I started off as a kid putting those little lead, lead weights on the line, losing it, getting hung up on the, on the logs and everything. And it's, I put a lot of lead into the water as a kid. Now the kid, I, and I went and looked after this conversation, I went to the Walmart this morning and I was, uh, I just went into the bait section and seeing, do they still sell these little, uh, fishing weights? Yes. Right. They still sell the little lead fishing weights. Okay. The EPA has never come along and said, no, you can no longer do this shit. All right. Okay. <laughs> so I'm thinking about all of the time and all of the little kids that are out there and grownups too, you know, that this is like 
we humans do things, all right? And I'm not going to be the one to tell this kid and his dad that they can't go out to the riverbank and go fishing because they're putting lead in the water. You got me? So yeah. I feel the same way about people. If I don't want to sit out in the sun and catch catch fish all day, if I can just like put one shot into the water and get my fish and I'm gone and I can do better shit with my time because I'm not out there with that bonding with the kid, you know? So right. you see where I'm going with all of this. It's just like the, uh, the same thing. Was, I don't know if you saw my sea salt thing that I did. It's the same thing with the sea salt. It really gets my goat when people start getting on. It's like when they do it to other people, too. It doesn't have to be that you're doing it to me. But it's like I, I'm not an unconscious person. I think about what I'm doing. And you're not going to like uh, uh, shit into anything. I, I share shit with people. Sometimes I joke around and stuff. But it's like, I, you're not going to get to me by, like, uh, criticizing me. I'll make a fool out of you, kind of like what I'm doing right now. But <laughs> I'm not going to uh, – uh, you're not going to affect my behavior because I've thought about what it is that I'm doing, and I'm comfortable with it. I don't really give a shit if you are. Right. So uh, that's my little rant. But what what would you th – what, what's your uh, – being a man that understands elements and stuff is uh, people uh, putting lead in the water like uh, chemicals or uh, kids or me or anybody else out there. Like, is uh, like, I understand we shouldn't be putting lead in the water, but like, is, if like, how, how do you, like, w how much focus is it really worth putting on such things? Not necessarily that one, but just all things like that, because we're living in a like large society with a lot of different people, different things. And your little, like, uh, contribution i don't know so I, I don't know how you uh, if you even want to respond to all of that but <laughs> well two, two things actually two stories popped up in my mind and and one is um basically how why we got rid of leaded gas and supposedly the story was this guy was trying to study meteorites from space and he wanted to know the lead content for whatever reason and um, he just kept getting these ridiculously absurd high numbers. And, you know, he's like, there can't be that much lead in this meteorite. It's just, it's not possible. And that's when they started testing the air, I believe, and started to find out that, well, internal combustion engines, yeah, lead's great for an anti-knock agent, but we're also combusting it and putting it into the air. And, and that's when we just shut down lead gas. That's a very different process than trying to, like, I guess, mineralize lead into water. You know, if you're throwing lead nitrate into a water, then it's just going to go into lead and nitrate, and you're going to jack the PPM of lead up exponentially. Um, but these things, like if you put a lead weight into water, it's not like it dissolves immediately. Now, if you get 100,000 people to do that in the same area on this, I don't know what time frame, like you could run into some problems. But at the end of the day, there's no way that, in my opinion, there's no way that going shotgun fishing will ever be more detrimental to the environment than using the amount of leaded gas we used in the 70s. If you want to talk about where the lead is in the watersheds and the ocean, I would guess it's from burning leaded gas. Um, and then the other, hmm. the other thing that popped into mind was uh, I saw this PBS special. It was amazing. And I forget the guy's name, but it was this black guy from Maryland. And he would go around to, 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 to clan members and, and basically sit down, have a cup of coffee with them and just talk. Instead of criticizing, you know, the way you believe is wrong, the way I believe is right, like, don't you know how ignorant you are to believe that way? And, and all that kind of negative uh, rhetoric, it, it doesn't work. But what he found is sitting down face to face, human to human, he got a large number of these people that were dead set in their ways to, to see the other side of the coin. And, you know, at the end of the day, like they would send them, send them their, their clan garb, um, you know, their hoods and their gowns. 
And uh, he would keep those as mementos of, you know, this person, I got, I got this person to change their mind on a very controversial topic. And, and I'm not, I'm trying not to be provocative or anything like that. It was just a PBS special that I thought was interesting. And at the end of the day, it's like, the more you just sit down one-on-one -on -one with people and have like a face-to-face -face conversation, the less bullshit that you're going to hear. Like it's so easy on Facebook to hide behind your screen and say whatever you want. But if I saw you in person, would I say the same thing? You know, <laughs> kind of mentality, or, or would I get my ass kicked? You know, like <laughs> so. Those are the two uh -huh. things that I was I was thinking about when you when you're bringing up lead in the water and uh, I, yeah, for part of me thinks that a lot of the damage was done way prior to to waiting around, waiting for a, a lead slug to dissolve in water. And there's always variables, right? How acidic's the water? That way you're gonna get more lead into the water if it's if it's really acidic. Um, so yeah, that's pretty, yeah. I love that. Yeah, I've always heard of dynamite fishing. So that might be more eco-friendly, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't have dynamite laying around. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we, we can make, we can nitrate some cop uh, next time, and we can make some dynamite like tamarind. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. People around here love that shit, man. It, I, I'm hearing a lot more of it going off too, man. It's like whenever they feel threatened, <laughs> you, they start wasting more ammo. <laughs> it's it really counterintuitive, you know. Oh, they're taking them. Better waste some more ammo. <laughs> yeah, it's not very it's like, logical. Yeah, <laughs> Take some valerian root. Let's calm that GABA receptor response down a little bit. You know, just relax. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, <laughs> well, this, this has been a, a lot of fun, man. As I'm glad that uh, me showing off my one of my wife's favorite plants spurred your mind into this this space and got you looking at this stuff, man. Because you you're definitely the guy to be looking at it as the the one that I know anyway. So, <laughs> well, thanks, man. Uh, I don't nice. know what. It, I don't know what else you want to talk about. Is there something else you want to do? You want to promote yourself or any way, man? You want to like sell yourself? This is do whatever you want to do. So, yeah, I got nothing to sell, really. I, you know, I I do a Love good it. job at my job. And, <laughs> uh, this is why I don't have a higher paying job is because I don't know how to bullshit and lie on my resume, you know. <laughs> <laughs> But, but I love what I'm oh, doing, so, and I got great support around me. So it's, um, yeah. I mean, I guess if you're in Glendive, Plentywood, or Sydney, uh, stop by around the clock cannabis and get some medicinal needs if you need it. But I can't imagine there there's that go, many people man. that are going to be jumping into those towns anytime soon. <laughs> but, yeah. So yeah, this has been yeah. a lot of fun and. I look well, forward to uh, so I guess we'll let everybody. Yeah, yeah. This is, uh, as much as, like I keep saying, as much as you want it to, and I, I will make time to, to do it because I, I really enjoy these conversations with you. I learn a lot, yeah. and uh, my wife's going to be very happy of, about your explanation with that that one particular one, and how we already know how to get it. So. <laughs> Right. Yeah, Thank I mean, you. you don't have to wait the 200 days or the two years for it to mature anymore. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So uh, I, I'm going to end this broadcast and stick around because I want to I want to joke around with you a little bit after this is over because I, oh, I okay, can't cool. talk about this on the air. I don't think that Peter would appreciate <laughs> that. So, <laughs> all right, everybody, okay. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I have. <laughs> Peace. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>